would open your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. First, I'm going to read these theme, these two theme verses out of Romans. Even though our theme verses are out of Romans, we're not going to be preaching out of Romans. For the next four weeks, we're going to be preaching out of Acts, more specifically the prison patches, passages in Acts, to really illuminate these verses in Romans. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to have one mind, one voice, one glory in God. And so we're going to be using Acts to illustrate this oneness that we are to have. So today, Acts chapter 5, I'm going to start reading with verse 12. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came in and said, Look, the men you put in the jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of Sanhedrin, a teacher of the law, was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin, and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theotis appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. They ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. 
The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching or proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Let's say a word of prayer. Would you pray that I can deliver God's message this morning, and I'll pray that we receive it. Let's have a moment for prayer. Father, we're here. We're ready. Give us what we need. In Jesus' name, amen. It was my first day, my junior year, at football practice. Football season's starting. I got to throw out some football stories. Sorry, that's just how it goes. But I'll bring us all along. First day, and the defensive coach called two numbers and said, come forward. One of them was my number. And one of them was another guy, but I was so afraid of this huge Italian football coach, I didn't even look at who else was coming out, but I ran up and stopped in front of him, and there was a guy by my side stopped next to me. And this coach said, you two are going to be the backbone of the left side of our defense. You guys are going to work together. You guys are going to communicate. You guys are going to know each other better than anyone else on the football field. You guys are going to be talking continually. You guys are going to control the left side of the ball. Do you understand me? And we both yelled, yes, sir. And the voice I heard next to me scared me. And I looked over, and I saw who it was, and I was even more scared. It was Enrique Ortiz. Let me tell you about Enrique Ortiz. We were polar opposites. I was six foot two, Enrique was five foot three. But don't mistake his size. The guy as a high schooler could bench 400 pounds, if you know anything about weightlifting. That is a strong guy, a short but very strong guy. He weighed 250 pounds, I weighed 230 pounds, but high and low. But that's not where the differences started. I was this pastor's kid, didn't cuss, I think I jaywalked once on a country road was probably the worst thing I'd ever done. Enrique Ortiz was a guada. Now, let me tell you what a guada is. They bust some kids in from this little community called Guadalupe. And if you were in a gang, because this community had a lot of gangs, you were called a guada. And they had a high school and college gang of young men and a lot of the older seniors juniors in high school boys from guada lupe were in this gang they were guadas but the thing about enrique he wasn't just a guada he was the guada he was the leader of the gang and i had heard stories of the things this guy did and the things this guy's done, and the things this guy's led others to do. And even if, I'm sure they were exaggerated, but even if like 5% of it was true, this was one scary dude, covered in tattoos next to the pastor's kid. And I'm sitting there, and I knew he was a good player. I knew he was strong. I wanted to play with him. But thinking that I have to start communicating with this guy who I never talked to in my life, I can be honest, I was afraid, I was scared. That's kind of the situation we got going on here in Acts. We have the disciples, look at verse 12 and 13. We have the apostles, you know, they were called disciples when they were with Jesus because that means you are a learner, you're learning from Jesus. But now that Jesus has left and left them the Holy Spirit, they are now the apostles, they are the messengers they are now to go out because they have been taught by Jesus and will be taught by the Holy Spirit. But the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colony, a very public place. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. So these apostles are doing miraculous things. They're sharing this message about Jesus, and the people are loving it. 
They want to be a part of it, but they're afraid because these people are breaking the law. They've been told not to talk about Jesus, and here they are in a public place. These apostles to them are a bunch of guadas. They're afraid. They, they just, we love what's going on, but we're just kind of afraid to join. They don't want to lose their life. I didn't want to mess up on the football field and have a hit put out on me. I didn't want to lose my life. And I want to say today, with Christians today, now there are places in the world where if you choose to become a Christian or be associated with Christians, your life is in danger. And I thank the Lord for the missionaries that are going into those places, aren't you? And there's missionaries from all over different churches, but in the Church of the Nazarene, we have missionaries that are going into these places where they cannot tell anyone what they're doing, but they're breaking the law and doing it anyway. They're the bad boys and the bad girls of the Nazarene church. <laughs> but I think some of us here at Grace Point, I think if we are going to join, if we're going to take the mindset of the body of Christ because that's what it's all about you know these people they just don't want to be associated they don't oh we're not we're not with them I think some of us today we're the same way we're afraid of losing our life if we truly truly commit to the body of Christ not losing it as in death but I think sometimes we're afraid if we give too much of our life we may lose some of our life we may lose some of our time. We may lose some of our schedule. We may lose some of our social life. We may, there's just things that we're going to lose in life if we truly commit to the body of Christ, if we truly commit to being a part of what Christ wants the church to be. And some of us, maybe at one time in my life, we committed, but now we just kind of move back on the fringe because there's just too I don't know, we just, we're afraid of what we might lose if we totally commit. Some of us are afraid to really talk to people in the church of Christ. Isn't that sad that some of us are just afraid to really get real with people, have real relationships? Some of us are just have anxiety about talking to people. We might as well have a sanctuary full of guadas right here because you're just afraid to go and talk to people and, and put yourself out there and get to know. And it was just, that was the way it was with these people, seeing these apostles do these miraculous things in the name of Jesus. This stuff is happening, and they want to be a part of it. So many didn't join. But we find out that some did. They may have not have stepped forward in Solomon's colonnade where they're out in public. But people still, they couldn't resist this movement. Look at verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. They joined them because they believed. They took the same state of mind they just couldn't resist what they're saying and the first step is you have to believe it they had to unite in mind with these disciples and what they were seeing and they believed and that affect their heart their soul they believed and man did it pay off look at verses 15 and 16 as a result so it the previous verse says more and more women believed and were added to their number. And as a result of more and more men and women believing and adding to the number, the result, the direct result of more and more men and women being unified with the body of Christ, as a result, people brought their sick into the streets, laid them on beds and mats. Crowds gathered from towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and people tormented, and everybody's getting healed. As a result of people unifying, becoming one mind, believing together, as a result of that, the apostles are doing greater things than they were before. What they were doing on their own as the 12 wasn't as powerful as what they were doing when 
the crowds unified when they came around. When we take on the same mind of God together, we are going to be more effective, not just as a group, but individually. Peter was more effective in and of himself when more and more believed. When you're part of the body of Christ, when you're unified with the body of Christ, you are more effective. What did Peter's shadow healing someone have to do with the others joining the movement? I don't know, but it was a direct result. God started doing things when people were united. Here's why I'm bringing this up. Maybe you have a granddaughter that isn't saved. Maybe you have a son that isn't saved. Maybe you have a sister or a brother that isn't saved. Maybe you have a childhood friend that is just not saved. Maybe you have a neighbor that isn't saved and you've been trying and trying and praying and praying. Have you ever thought that you and I, when we have people in our lives that we want to minister, that we can minister to those people more effectively if we are more united with the body of Christ? Have you ever thought about that? Because that's what's happening right here. The disciples are doing stuff, but once they are united with the people, they're really doing stuff. And sometimes we're kind of lone wolfing it out there. We're coming to church. We've got a couple people, but we're not really coming in with a heart or a mindset that I am a part of this body. But here, according to Scripture, once they are united with people, their individual ministries are more effective. And I can be more effective with that childhood friend that needs Christ the more I'm connected to the body, the more I'm unified in mind and spirit with the body of Christ, the more effective you'll be with your son or your grandchild or whoever it is you have a heart for. Have you ever, I think sometimes we don't realize things like that are connected. The more we're connected to the body, the greater our ministry, the greater things God's going to do, the greater healings are going to happen when we are unified. I mean, wouldn't it be worth us at Grace Point unifying, Grace Point unifying if that meant Albany was going to see more of the power of Jesus Christ? Would that be worth it? That would be worth it. We have to come together. We have to be of one mind. We have to be unified together. And we're going to see what God can do. God makes us more effective when people come together, when we have the same mind in God. This Greek word for join together, when they join together, I love the Greek word. It means cemented. They were cemented together. We have to be cemented, cemented together. And when we are, God is going to do powerful things that are going to defy logic. I didn't know that could happen. I didn't know that person could be healed. I didn't know that person could be saved. It's going to happen when we unify. That's why we want to be of one mind. We want to believe together. We want to believe not individually. We want to believe together. We're in this together. More effective when you come together. That was the story of me and Enrique. It didn't take me long to realize he wanted to make this work with me. He was willing to try. And once I saw he was willing to try, man, I was able to show that I was willing to try. And he and I started talking back and forth. And he and I started really communicating, and we could do it. And then pretty soon after the whistle blow, sometimes he would throw a joke out, or I'd throw a joke out. We started becoming friends. And by midway through the season, season, we were buddies, And we were communicating, and we could tell what each other were going to do on the football field, and we were friends. We high-fiving all the time around school. We would say hi. He and I unified, and, man, we were effective on the football field. Our coach came up with a great plan. He wanted us to high-low people. 
This is what a high-low is on a football field. It's pretty easy. One person hits them high, the other person hits them low. There's a lot of people you don't want to go out for a pass or you don't want to go down the field. And so to stop them, coach said, I want you two to start high-lowing. So you got a 250-pound, 5'3 guy hitting you low, and you got a 6'2", 230-pound guy hitting you high. And we didn't have to be skilled people, because if that happens, you know what that does to the human body? That turns you into a windmill, and you just go. And he would hit him low, and I would hit him high, and that person would not run down the field. And the great thing is, when we would step up to the line and these guys on the other team would come out, you know, a lot of times the other team would watch films of the other team. And I could always tell the guys who had watched the films of Enrique and I high-lowing people, because they'd be walking out and these tight ends, would, their eyes would be like saucers. Because if you know that this guy's about to hit you low, this guy's about to hit you high, that would not be fun to go face that. And we could see fear in the eyes of these guys who had watched films. I tell you, here in Acts, the effectiveness of God's people start causing fear. It starts, the eyes are getting wide at what they're doing. And there's jealousy. Look at verse 17 and 18. Then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They're jealous they arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. It's one thing to be jealous, but when you're having people arrested and put in jail, that's beyond jealousy. That's when fear is setting in. Fear of what's going on. Fear of what these people are doing. And I tell you what, when we become one in mind and God is blessing us and making us more effective, when we become one and unified as a people, we become a threat to this world, don't we? Don't we become a threat to the way this world does things the more unified we are with the way Jesus does things? We become a threat to this world. We become a threat to the prince of this world. And we need to expect some opposition. We need to expect pushback. If through this sermon series you make a commitment, I need to be more unified with my church. I'm going to tell you right now on this first Sunday, right off the bat, expect some opposition. Expect some opposition from people in this community. Expect some opposition from the enemy trying to disrupt your home. Expect some opposition online. I heard there's some Christian opposition online. I don't know, but pretty sure it's there expect some opposition unfortunately by attacks within expect some opposition and maybe you've seen this maybe you've experienced this i've seen this before christian comes into a church they're excited they're wanting to totally connect with the church they're wanting to be involved they're wanting to unify with a body and then something happens one challenging situation happens or one disagreement happens or they're attacked by a worker it has nothing to do with the church for the time they're spending in church or they're attacked by family and it just disrupts them and as much as they were trying to get unified they start backpedaling because of the opposition thankful for the examples of these apostles these apostles weren't perfect but when they faced opposition, they didn't retreat. We can't either. We can't lose our mindset at the first sign of struggle and opposition. We got to remember that the world is going to oppose us. We also got to remember that a lot of times we're getting opposed by the world because the world is acting out of fear. Those internet warriors a lot of times are acting out of fear. Those people slamming you on Facebook for your beliefs are acting out of fear. Those kids at school are acting out of fear. Those people at work who are mocking what you do at church, a lot of them are acting out of fear. Fear that we may have something they don't. Fear that they may be wrong and they just want to mock so they convince themselves that they're right. 
fear that Jesus may be the truth, the way, and the light. Look at verse 50, verse 26. I love this verse because it's such a, it, it almost seems like a contradiction. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. So they're arresting them and bringing them before a judge, but they're not using force because they're, they're acting out of fear. They're afraid of the people. So it's like, come this way if you will. Can I get you a beverage as we go to the courthouse? You know, it's like, there's just this passive aggressive thing. They're, they've got fear, but they want to oppose. They're afraid. But they can still organize afraid when they oppose. Anybody like the Peanuts comic strip, Charles Schultz? Anybody read those growing up? Here's one. I love this one with Lucy and Linus. Lucy says, switch channels. Next, she said, I said switch channels. I want to watch my program. Linus says, are you kidding? What makes you think you can just walk right in here and take over? Lucy says, these five fingers, individually, they're nothing. But when I curl them together like this into a single unit, they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. <laughs> Linus says, which channel do you want? And then he says, why can't you guys get organized like that? <laughs> I hope, I hope that we as the body of Christ can be more organized than the world that opposes us. I hope that we can be more of one mind in sharing the gospel than people can be in one mind opposing it. I hope we can be organized better than them. And not just with Grace Point. I'm talking about Christians everywhere. I'm talking about churches everywhere. But if it's going to happen, for us, it's got to start at Grace Point, right? If we can't be organized and have one mind here, then what hope do we have to have it anywhere else? It's got to start with Grace Point. It's got to be intentional, having one mind. Well, football season ended that year, and January came where my birthday is, and it was my birthday, and I'm at my locker, and I'm just opening my locker, and I hear a voice, and it's Enrique's voice, say, hey, Brent, and I turn around, and Enrique's standing there, and he's got four guadas with him, four of his gang members two on each side and he says go and when he says go all five of them start punching me start swinging hard aiming everywhere and when you got five guys punching you I know Bruce Lee would do it but you don't really fight back you just try to protect yourself and I'd seen Rocky enough where you just go like this and you're just trying to block as many as you can but for the longest 15 seconds of my life these guys pummeled me pummeled me kept hitting me and hitting me all five of them and I am just trying to take it and after 15 seconds Enrique goes stop and all of them are breathing heavy because they were just punching me with all the force they had and Enrique goes happy birthday Brent <laughs> slaps me five and hugs me and the four guadas all pat me on the shoulders, and they start walking down the hallway. And I yell out, have you heard of a birthday card? <laughs> and later that day, I'm in my coach's classroom. None of the guadas were in there, but other football guys are in there. And they could see the marks on me, and I'm telling them what happened. And a lot of the guys in there are laughing and making fun of me and laughing because I got beat up. And my coach said, hey, how many of you guys had that happen to them by the Guada guys on your birthday? And none of them raised their hand. And my coach, I'll never forget these words, he said, that means something. And I remember walking out of that classroom. <laughs> That's right. I got beat up by the Guadas. That means something. 
I tell you what, you want to know the response we need to have when we face opposition? You know, when we seek to have the same mind as others in Christ, there's going to be some bruises. There's going to be some punches. The world's going to take shots at us. Sometimes within the church, we're going to disagree, trying to have the same mindset. I don't have to ask for a raise of hands on who's experienced that in the church. Some of us may have scars from the world. Some of us may have scars from some disagreements in the church, from being united with the church, from other church members, from board members, and dare I say it, maybe from a pastor or two. If we suffer for being united in Christ, how should we respond? This is the beauty of the gospel. It's telling us this morning we need to rejoice. We need to rejoice like we just got beat up by a bunch of guadas. Look at verse 40. That's the example of the apostles. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. That means whipped over and over and over. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering to disgrace for the name. Talk about having the main, same mindset. It doesn't say half of them rejoicing and half of them left. It says all of them were rejoicing because it was so worth it to be unified together for Christ that the suffering doesn't change that. They rejoiced. A group of people who even rejoice when they're suffering because their eyes are on Jesus. I want to be a part of that church, don't you? That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. I want to close with this. I want to close with the ending speech of the one guy who had some sense to him and stood up. Let's close with these two verses, 38 and 39. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. If we're united on a human level or an interest level or this is just what we do and we're not united by our minds in Christ, it's going to fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. We come together with the mind of God. Even if there's a struggle, we will not be stopped. So I ask you these questions. Have we been disconnected? Have you felt disconnected from the body of Christ? Are you not investing in relationships like you have before in church? Has it been a while since you've invited someone into your home from the body of Christ? Are we not seeing ourselves as one with the body, but rather just someone who attends? Have we been distancing ourselves? And we may have reasons, we may have struggles, we may have suffered in the past, but don't let the enemy fool you. You're not fighting against a church. You're not fighting against certain personalities in the church. You're not fighting against the way the church is done. No, God desires us to be united. We're fighting against God when we are distancing ourselves. Don't fight against God. You're never going to win. He wants you united. He wants all of us united in one mind. I'm going to ask the praise team if they'll come forward right now. Would you bow your heads? We're going to say a prayer right now. With heads bowed, I, I just want to ask this question. And whether you feel united with this church or not, how many in here would say, I want to be more united with the body of Christ. Raise your hand this morning. Amen. Amen. Father, unite us. And that's not something we can do in our own strength. We just have to be willing, and you will unite us. Christ will unite us. Your Holy Spirit will unite us. And, Father, we're going to be far more effective and powerful than we could ever be on our own. Father, unite Grace Point. And then bless us as we minister 
to our friends, family, neighbors, strangers, Lord. Let people see the miracle of Christ working in our community. In his name we pray, amen.